You're listening to Kicked Back presented by Uber One. Uber One is a membership that lets you save across Uber Eats, Uber Rides, and everything in between. Enjoy unlimited $0 delivery fees, 5% off of Eats, 5% off of Rides, and if you join Uber One today, you can get your first month free. Visit uber.com slash Uber One for details. episode, I don't even know what number yet, of Kicked Back, presented by Uber One. And if you're watching, you're going to notice that we're in a new studio, thanks to our MVP, Liam, who set this entire thing up. Liam, yeah, thanks, man. No problem. I did a lot of digging in my parents' basement <laughs> for all this like, <laughs> random crap we got around. We've got a shoot monthly annual from 2008, a match of the day annual from 2008. One has Kaka, one has Ronaldo, so I figured that'd be good for Caroline's side. Then we have our Match Magazine Annual from 2011. I got my Bolton Wanderers ball. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and then I have a program. I got my little Subutio men here. I got Newcastle, Bolton, Chelsea, and Brazil. And then I have a program from when Bolton played Atletico Madrid in the uh, Europa League. This to me is so, s- this is sick. And I have to bring some of my stuff in now, um, which I'll do for next episode. But to have magazines from 2008... Like, I think that's so cool. I, I sometimes think about the fact that I wish I had kept a lot of my magazines from back in the day mm. to kind of have now to see how things have changed yeah. and how things have been differently marketed throughout our sport. But this to me is wild. Like, well, even having something that, that, you know, you have Ronaldo, Van Nistelrooy, Terry, Gerard, like all that stuff is so cool. It is cool. And even uh, if you look at the match of the day one, it says on it, the 100, hot 100 world's best players. Which isn't really a good sentence, to be honest. The Hot 100, the world's best players rated. This shit's got to be a comma in there somewhere. Either way, I haven't looked through that yet, so I'm very curious to see who's kind of... I would assume Ronaldo is probably near the top. Yeah. Some of the other players on the bottom, Pepe Reina, Thierry Henry at Barcelona, Totti. I think that's Fabregas, Kaká, Ronaldinho. Yeah, like even looking on your side, you got Drogba, Tevez. I haven't heard Tevez's name in forever. Yeah. It's so cool to see. We were talking about it last show, how... (laughs) David our day, on there too? yeah our day and age we miss all those guys uh crazy enough on this show with the europa league we'll be talking about some of those guys who are players mm-hmm. and who are now coaching teams van nistelrooy <laughs> yeah. being one of them on, yeah. on my side because he uh was he P- PSV. psv yeah 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 so was, that's crazy yeah so uh yeah it was pretty cool i had to go digging in my parents basement for some some stuff I was really trying to find more programs from games I went to. Yeah. Like I have a program somewhere of when England played Greece at Old Trafford. I went to that game. England won four 0 that night. There's a there was a bunch. I have a. I was I was trying to find some my like, stuff my dad had from when he was younger. And one thing I did find was a, a newspaper from 2001, I think it was, and it was like in like this plastic bag, and it was the year Bolton got promoted to the Premier League. So it was like all, it was like the Bolton Evening News and it was all about like that. And Crazy. I was trying to find somewhere to put it. We got some shelves and stuff here. Still, I love so it. Maybe we'll figure it out. We're probably going to get another flag here. Perfect. Um, and, you know, we'll get some Canada stuff. Canada I saw, stuff. I saw a flat uh, scarf. I almost bought an England one. Perfect. Which uh, England squad was announced today. When I was, which I saw, yeah. Yeah. A lot I, of squads. I, mean, I spoke about it with Brett a little bit this morning. Yeah. We were a little bit opposite sides of the spectrum. Why? Well, he just like listed a bunch of guys who should have been there and shouldn't have been there. And I think at the end of the day, you're picking a 26-man squad. Not easy. It's not easy. You've got to think of flexibility within your squad. You can't have too many players that are the same. Uh, one player that Brett mentioned, and I think a lot of people have spoke about it too, is Calvin Phillips. Okay. He hasn't played this season. Like He's been injured. I think he's played like five minutes at mm-hmm. the most. But he made the team. But we spoke about it a few shows ago too, how picking these teams – there's not a lot of time to, to get your system in place. And you almost got to take someone like a Calvin Phillips who knows what's going to happen. And you just can't take too many wild cards, I guess, is the big thing. And I think Gareth Southgate overall picked a very good squad. It's not an easy job. I can't, I, I would never want to be in that position because the amount of factors you would have to think about. What if this happens? What's our depth look like? What's a guy that's good for the locker room? What's a guy that if our star player can't do the job, then we have, you know, the next best guy to come in and do the job. Yep. Things that, you know, also things that we don't see inside training sessions that we don't see inside the locker room. These coaches are very, you know, present yep. for. Uh, so it's easy for us to sit and kind of judge, but 
these are things, again, that we don't know. I, I was seeing on Twitter yesterday that apparently Kamavinga was left off of the roster. Yeah, there was a big rumor about that, but he did make the did team. Did he? he? Okay, did I didn't. He did make the team, and I, yeah, I, I would have been shocked. especially with Well, especially with Pogba and Conte both not in the squad. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense not to have Kamavinga then. It would have been wild. Oh, I, would have been I wouldn't crazy. have agreed with that one. I'd been like, no. how do you leave that guy off? Yeah, maybe we'll, we can probably pull up the, the squad on the on the big screen later on when we, if we get into it. But We'll have like our nice presentation yeah, screen. <laughs> yeah, we got to figure out what I was trying to do. I'm not really technically savvy. Like I, apparently neither. I'm good at building stuff, but I was trying to get like a bit of a slideshow on so then I could just like skip through but i couldn't figure out how to get it on a full screen that's um so. when kicked back gets a producer on board that's our yeah. next yeah so a big thing now we got if you can see too we got this little third of the bottom big upgrades in like Woo. two days here guys we're making moves <laughs> uh world cups right around the corner kicked backs making moves and we're actually now literally kicking it back i know we're on these chairs i have to move my mic while i talk <laughs> we're on these chairs we're chilling <laughs> We're not at a, a desk, and we're the, literally kicking it back. These chairs have been a, a bit of a hot debate in the office. So these were just casually just in the office, and then we moved some stuff around, and we got these chairs. So I thought instead of buying them, I'll grab them. So now we're trying to test out if they are too relaxed. I feel comfortable. I feel – I'm I, not bad. I feel very relaxed. I feel very – conversational kicked I, back. I, ki I feel kicked back <laughs> you know what if i had to sit on this chair and actually like type let's for example sure. say my pregame notes i wouldn't get much work done no. this is a chair that if i had to be like okay we're doing our podcast in an hour and i need to organize myself i'd probably pull out my phone and start scrolling on tiktok because i'm chilling yeah but yeah. now all our work's done and we get to talk about everything and chill. We're vibing. We're vibing. We're it's vibing. a vibe. It's a vibe. All right, guys. Europa League. Let's <laughs> give uh, some love to the Europa League right now. Round of 16. And we were saying this about the Champions League. Uh, so many games that I feel like are blockbuster worthy, but we're getting the same stuff in the Europa League. Yeah. There's, uh, going through all the, the teams and stuff like that last night when I was doing my notes, there's, um, there's a lot of conversation to be had here. It's, yeah. The fun thing about the Europa League, and I've always kind of found this, is it's really anyone's competition. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you have these Champions League teams coming down, but also a lot of them are pissed off to be there. They don't want to be in this competition. And I think the <laughs> lack of effort kind of takes that on too. And, like, you know, we've got a lot. Like, look mm -hmm. at the teams in this. Like, FC Barcelona, Juventus, Sporting, Shakhtar, a Ajax, Bayer Leverkusen, Sevilla, Salzburg. Those are the Champions League teams that have dropped down. So I guess for people who don't know basically how it works is everyone who is, finishes first in a group in the Europa League gets essentially a bye to the next round. And then all the teams that finish third in the Champions League come down and play the teams that are second in the Europa mm -hmm. League, which leads us to some of the some fantastic European matchups. I mean, OK, so we, let's just start off with the one that's headlining the Europa League right now, and one that I think everyone's like, of course, this would be the draw. Yeah, of course. And people were not happy about it and being like, oh, it's rigged, it's rigged. It's like, all I have to say is just win your games and you won't get there. I don't care if it's rigged. Give <laughs> me this game in the round of 16. I uh, I left a comment on actually was his video, and uh, after he was saying like it was rigged, and I just said, no, this is exactly what we want. Rigged or not, like I do not care. Like, I want the best on best every single game. I agree, and... Like I said, I don't care if this is rigged at all because we have a round of 16 matchup right now where either Ten Hag or Xavi is going to sink or swim. And I love to see two of the most iconic clubs in the world who are extremely messy and chaotic this season yeah. have an exit out of the Europa League in the round of 16. You can't make this up, rigged or not. I don't really give a shit. This is a game that I'm like... I, I, I'm treating this like a Champions League final. I know. And when I was, I actually made no notes on this game because I just figured I could just talk uh, of about course, it. Right? But I, the thing that I thought about the most was, was like, we've seen it, of course, but I was like, imagine if Messi was still in Barcelona and we got Messi and Ronaldo again imagine. with two like such iconic footballing brands in Barcelona and United. It would have been Epic. fantastic. But now we get to see Pedri play at Old Trafford and, you know, Sancho play at uh, the, uh, not the Bernabeu. Where do they play again? The new camp. camp. Yeah. Oh, man. That was a bit of a brain it's fart. No, it's but, okay. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy that one, Boston. <laughs> um, we can't yeah. let them forget. <laughs> yeah. This, I think this is going to be a really good, interesting tie for both teams. Because at this moment in time, 
I would give the edge to Manchester United. However, when February comes around, who knows? Who really knows? Because they're not going to have all this chaoticness. And both teams will be in this too. But like mm-hmm. Barcelona won't have to have the criticism of not qualifying in the Champions League, which I would imagine weighs heavily on players. And then also not playing in the Champions League every single week. Right now, they're first in La Liga. It's interesting. There's a lot, a lot going on. I know. I know. We got some notes on like the goal scoring and stuff like that. They, that Barcelona doesn't have, I guess, in a way. And then United coming together, and then all of a sudden have a terrible game against Aston Villa. I would guess, suppose a weakened team. There's just such a yo-yo club, both of them right now. Hundred percent. To me, Manchester United and Barcelona mirror each other this season. They're both iconic. They're both both talented football clubs with talented players, but they're both a chaotic mess. Yeah. And they're super inconsistent. So the fact that they're playing each other is wild and like extremely entertaining for someone who isn't a supporter of either team. Right. So this is where um, I'm I'm trying to figure out I'm like, where do I stand on on the side of the fence in this matchup? And I just have to, for one reason alone, because I think that they are similar in the sense of everything that I just listed, I have to give United, I have to say that I think United's going to beat Barcelona. And it's because Barcelona at this moment in time are solely relying on Lewandowski to score goals. Lewandowski right now in all competitions has 18 goals. The next guy behind him is Dembele, who has five. That's a large gap. And Lewandowski, you know, he's a big player who shows up um, to big games, to big moments. But when you're taking on a team like Manchester United, you can't just think that one guy is going to get the job done because United, despite what's happening at their club and their inconsistencies, they will have the ability to shut him down. They're not a poor team, right? So I think Barcelona, if they only look to Lewandowski, they won't find success against United. And I also think Barcelona, when they have a game and they make mistakes in a game, they're not quick to fix it into the next game. And like I've said in previous shows, this has been like a consistent theme for them since last season. Uh, Like how they continuously leave players unmarked uh, at the top of the box blows my mind and and these are things that if it happens against United United does have critical players that can absolutely capitalize on those moments uh in my opinion it can go either way it's funny I want Barcelona to win and I want Xavi to have that success but I really think it'll be Ten Hag and United yeah I guess my my point of view on it isn't even the talent on the pitch it's more of Ten Hag has won big European games in his career. True. And Xavi just hasn't. And the second leg is at Old Trafford, which I think I know on Tuesday I was talking about a lot of the games, how I think like some teams have more of an advantage in the first leg, where like I think the United crowd is is special and obviously at the new camp too. But I just think United fans just live for these massive games. Mm-hmm. And I really, really think they'll get behind them. Like you saw it like United have beaten Arsenal and Liverpool at Old Trafford this season, especially like the Liverpool game. Like that they looked down and out. Then, I know. Like it was only two games into the season, but like they looked horrendous and then they got up for it. I got a feeling United will take this one. It's really hard to say because like we've said, like teams are just in such shambles right now and in four months, like so much could happen. Like ja- they have the January transfer window in there, like Maybe Ten Hag is able to bring in a couple more guys. Is Ronaldo even on this team right. in in February when this tie goes? Like, it's interesting. I guess at this moment in time, I will give the edge to Manchester United. Okay. Ask me again in February. <laughs> I know that's what's wild about this situation is we can have our predictions again. I think United will be Barcelona, but a lot can happen from now until February. We have so much in between. Yeah. In this gap. Yeah, there's the, well, we have a whole World Cup. A whole World Cup. We, we have a full transfer, transfer window. window. <laughs> All these other games, and yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to predict fully right now. But I think if we're doing some early predictions, United. I'm on the United train. I think as a squad, they're probably playing a bit better right now under their manager, and the manager thing just is a bit of a. I know, but it's it's funny to say like they're playing a bit better because Barcelona's first. But I don't know. I just. Something about it. United have done well in Europe this year. They've they lost the one game against Real Sociedad at home, which pretty much the reason why they're playing yeah. Barcelona. But yeah, I, I got a feeling United are going to get up for this one and, and win this one. 
one thing, because I do like your point about Ten Hag. I don't love Ten Hag right now. I'm, anyone who listens to this podcast knows why. But I do feel like he's a gamer. Like, you got to give credit to Ten Hag. He's had success um, in w- with Ajax. He, he, he has this, like, there's something about him where I don't think he stands down from a challenge. And he just gives this gamer vibe yeah. every, every time you see him. Xavi looks afraid right now. Xavi looks like a deer in the headlights. And I say that respectfully. He was one of my favorite players when he played. But... It, when he talks to the media, he looks defeated. He looks worried. He says this is the worst draw they could have had, which, yes, we all know that as football fans. For Barcelona, that sucks. However, like, pick and choose the things that you're going to say to the media. In my opinion, I don't think he necessarily has that experience as a manager. And by looking at his face, I'm like, I wonder if he already knows the way his team feels about that. And he's just, I don't know. D- to me, it's like, Ten Hag kind of has the upper hand right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I think there's only probably two teams I would have wanted if I was Barcelona. Like, <laughs> Do you want any team if you're Barcelona? There's very few. Like, There's a lot of good European clubs in there. Like Rome. Rome has obviously got a lot of good players. Yep. I think they've underperformed in Syria and the Europa League. PSV. They beat Arsenal. One of two teams yep. to beat Arsenal this season. United being the other one. Monaco is a good team. I have... Th- they probably should have won the group, but they were a Champions League qualified team that lost to PSV in qualification. Union Berlin, really good in I love them right in now. Bundesliga. Like there's a, there's probably a couple of lower end teams, I suppose, that they would have wanted. Like but at the end of the day, like this is what you got. You can't just go out and say, like, oh, this draw wasn't great for us. It's like, no, like we're Barcelona. You are probably the best you should be the best team in this competition. Ah, that's exactly it. You have Barcelona probably one of the most widely known football clubs in the world, at least in the conversation, if, if you want to make yeah. that argument. And you know that your stadium is a tough stadium to play in. You know that your your team has respect on the name. You There's so many components that go to Barcelona that even if they were taking on Real Madrid in this game, they shouldn't be entering with this like, this is the worst draw ever. Yeah. That's where I'm just like, I don't, and again, a lot of things can happen – when, until we get to February, but right now, just by the conversation and everything, I'm like, and maybe they can. This team can get it together, and Dembele starts, you know, um, scoring more goals, and they have other guys who contribute in in the attack. But right now, by the looks of it, I just am not. I don't think Xavi's the guy to take this team forward in like a European so stance. I think he's done a really good job of building a more of a an identity in La Liga and getting them where to they rightfully belong at the top of La Liga, right up there. And but I think Barcelona needs to be patient with him if mm-hmm. they do believe that too. And this will be a big tie for him. If they lose this one, I'm very curious to kind of see the repercussions after. Like what are they gonna do? It's so sad. Cause I want him to do so well. Me too. I was uh, but it's always that there's always that factor, isn't there of higher in form of players yeah. of like you know you you lose your legendary status like you look at Oli Gunnar Solskjaer like yeah there's one right there like people have really like he's he's not that hero of 99 as much anymore and like you know it's just kind of sad and like some like Lampard with Chelsea like you know you hope like the fans and I, I think I think they do like those two guys especially like people understand and everything but i yeah i don't know if i was a former player and i understand you want to take your team back to the top and become more iconic zidane's a good example of it actually working but yeah i don't know i'm always on the edge of that zidane i think that's why zidane's like goaded because he was one of the best players we'll ever see and then is in the conversation as an unbelievable manager yeah he did it it's uh it's tough to do it's very tough to do um okay so oh sorry one more thing on barcelona pk so okay. PK's retired. Yeah, I saw that. Did you see he got a red card? So now he can't play in his last game. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. So that <laughs> Can they like reverse the rule just uh, for him? Yeah, I don't know. Do you know one thing that really bugs me about that though? Is like Barcelona's in all this financial difficulty, right? And people have said he's like he's probably the worst player on the team at the moment. But he's just like was he told to do this? Was this a decision he made on his own? Was this a decision to like for the benefit of the club? It bugs me that he, that he is retiring or yeah, that yeah yeah so they get more money. This is what I mean, right? This is in my conversation of players. Um, they have the right to be selfish, and yep. when players kind of stand up against a club or against a manager, 
and they look out for themselves, it's not always a bad thing because at the end of the day, if a club or a manager or management uh, doesn't like you, wants to trade you, wants you to retire, wants you to take a pay cut, they will make it happen because oh, yeah. they are being selfish. They're doing what's best for them. And in the same breath, I think footballers and athletes across any sport have the same right and the same ability. So I think it's a business. People forget that. People are like, loyalty to the club, loyalty to the team. I'm like, it's a business at the end of the day. Money is involved, right? Yeah. No one cares when you could get a large sum of money. So people always need to remember that. Yeah. I'm going to change the slide really quickly. All right. What are you putting on? I am going to put on. I figured this. I prepared a couple of slides. Like I said, I was trying to make it so that we could put it. these on throughout the show. So I wish I could just press a button. Meanwhile, but this is probably a good one. Oh, I'm extending my leg, guys. My <laughs> my bad knee, the one I had three surgeries on, when it's bent for too long, I get really bad aches and pains. So there we go. I'm extending that guy out. Probably a good thing to have. Oh, I like this. <laughs> okay, so this is what we just talked about. We're pointing to Barcelona, Manchester United. Where should we go next? I wanted to talk about Xabi Alonso because it's oh, you yeah. know let's talk about Xavi's friend. Yeah, well, right. There's another Spaniard, Javi to Javi. Yeah, I know, right? Javi to Javi. <laughs> How hard is that to say? Uh, we were saying on our last show, right? Like um, a footballer that I don't know if I'd go as far as saying he's underrated because he was incredible, but maybe not talked as much about because he was always in kind of the shadow of Xavi and Iniesta, which of course anyone would understand why. But Xavi Alonso was a guy who was like unreal and such a critical component of a team in any team that he was on. Mm -hmm. um, and now you kind of see the same thing as his newest and like biggest role into this manager of Bayer Leverkusen. Uh, you're not hearing as much about him because, you know, still guys like Xavi are in the forefront and they're still in the limelight with the media. Yeah. But this guy's doing some silent work with Bayer Leverkusen. Well, they had a massive win the other day. Yep. Uh, with he, Union, Union Berlin. Berlin. They scored all their goals in the second half. Sick. And they won 5-0. Yeah, five nothing. Yeah, against Union Berlin, who are one of the best defensive teams in La Liga. So going into that game, I pulled it up here. Um, in, in in the Bundesliga. I'm sorry, Bundesliga. Yeah. Union Berlin in the last two games have conceded seven goals, so that puts them at eleven, uh, sixteen on the season. Yeah. So they had only conceded nine goals, which is which is and now, and now that win now puts Bayern Munich at the top of the Bundesliga. Yeah. So it's a big game changer. We'll get to Union Berlin a little bit later because they're in this draw too, right here. Yeah, I love I love that we have our little <laughs> uh, screen. Bayer Leverkusen, terrible season. <laughs> really, really bad season. Thirteenth in the league. Oh man, they this <laughs> they have so much talent on this team, and luckily it's. It's being turned around. Like, Javi Alonso has done a good well. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, we always get the momentum from a new manager, but yep. it feels sustainable because this team is, is so good on its own. And Champions League, they really struggled. I was surprised, actually, they ended up being the Europa League team. But Atletico Madrid kind of screwed themselves a little bit. And that was actually Bayer Leverkusen's, Bayer Leverkusen's only win. Yeah. Was against Big Atletico. win. Big Massive win, though. Win. Yeah. Massive win. And, yeah, this team, Diaby... Fri uh, Fring Pong, Patrick Schick, who got the golden boot of mm -hmm. the Euros. Uh, when was that? Last summer now. Not, yeah. Because yeah, it was 2020, but a different year. Game changer, though. Florian Wurz is going to come back and return for them. He had eight goals and 10 assists in 24 games last season. Damn. I believe he's only like 20, 21. He's a really young player. He's going to be one of the best players in the world. He's just been injured all this season. He's going to come in and bring a very positive yeah. impact on this team. And it's going to help uh, them climb up the standings. It's it's disappointing for the Bayer Leverkusen just in everything because I think coming into this season, a lot of their fans had a lot of positive things to say. They they had so many, so much promise. Like people were talking about them challenging for the Bundesliga, and it just went so bad. Now that doesn't seem like it. Like Caroline just said, the thirteenth in the league, four wins, fifteen points. To put that into perspective. Fourth for the next Champions League spot, which Frankfurt currently hold is 26. Yeah. So they've got some ground to make up. I think right now they'll actually really focus on winning this competition to try and advance into the Champions League next season. Which I don't... I, here's the thing. I think, you know, they're not a powerhouse team. 
Mm-hmm. I think Shabby Alonso is, is doing, again, silent work. You know, he needs time still. Like, I think these are situations where the manager needs time and, you know, everyone needs to find their footing. But I do think that they can get there. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they beat Monaco and they advanced. No. And that's and, and respectfully, Monaco's in fifth in league uh, right now. So that's another good team. But I just... There's something about these German teams that I really, really love with their supporters, hardcore fans, um, very loyal. Uh, and I just love seeing Shabby Alonso when when he beats a team like Union Berlin 5 nothing. You know that there's potential within his squad and you know that he's making these tactical changes at halftime that a lot of managers can't make, right? Like Shabby didn't make a tactical change in the El Clasico against Real Madrid. Yeah. Shabby Alonso has that potential. I think I think this is a really good spot for Alonso too, where yes, they're not a massive club worldwide, but mm-hmm. they they've got big expectations yeah. in Germany. Like they finished third last season in the Bundesliga and <laughs> they are a very respected team within that. and and a good European team yeah. too. Like in the early two thousands they went to the Champions League final. I think they lost to Real Madrid. Yeah, they did. Because Zidane had that sick goal. Another another Zidane moment right there. <laughs> but so good. Monaco like you said, fifth in league earn right now. I feel like they are underachieving a little bit. It is a close one, but their group, they probably should have won the group as well. They finished second in their group um, because they lost. They like they had 10 points, um, a goal difference of one. And in the first place team, I don't know, I'm going to try and say this name. Furring, oh man, they're, hung, so they're, they're a Hungarian team. They were in the Champions League a couple of years ago, maybe even last season. Yeah. They made their first Champions League appearance last year. I don't know. I'm going to say it. Whatever. <laughs> Everyone knows I don't do names, but they lost to them on the first match day, and that pretty much prevented them from winning Group H. And now Monaco, I would say, honestly, just looking at this and talking about like the expectations of these Champions League teams, they're probably the one team that's like, man, we did not want to play by Leverkusen because they're on the up. They got a lot of lot to it. Uh, Lot to come, and I think they'll try and win this competition. I like by Leverkusen to win this tie. Me too. Yeah. So I agree with you, and it's also interesting that you say last season they were in third, and now they're in thirteenth in the table. It shows you the picture of the Bundesliga. Yeah. Union Berlin, Bayern Munich, Bayer Leverkusen, Frankfurt. These are all teams that are competing. These are all teams that we're, we've seen in the Champions League. Dortmund, uh, you know, is another team that's in the Champions League that's doing well. The, it's not as much of, of a like low tier league or farmers league like we've heard people call it as people think i think it's the second best league in I, uh, third best league Syria. i uh, yeah i i <laughs> love Serie A and and honestly when i wake up in the mornings on the weekend my husband he's watching the bundesliga out of every single league he could put on the tv he's watching the bundesliga yeah. and that should tell you something he's a casual football fan i don't even know if i'd call him a football fan he's a <laughs> casual like hardcore sports fan casual like let's flip through the channel and see what's on and he's always 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 going to the bundesliga and we have fubo we have DAZN, we have these channels mm-hmm. where he can go and watch he's always going back to the bundesliga well do you remember when covid happened and then sports were coming back the bundesliga was the one the first one the who, first yeah. one to come back and i remember <laughs> just every, i was so intrigued by it just because there's so much and that was at that time too that's when like Kai Havertz was still in the yep. league with, with uh, Bayer Leverkusen, actually. And, uh, and Timo Werner was there. Uh, Rashid Sir was on Werder Bremen. It felt like every single team had somebody. And there was a lot of story to be told. And I just love the history of the Bundesliga. Yes, Bayern Munich have dominated it for the last 10 years. But there's so many other teams that have, are so great in that league. And <laughs> I've mentioned it before, but like my dad is a, is a Armenia Bielefeld, was an Armenia Bielefeld fan when... He was lived in Germany, and we remember watching them because that was kind of when they were in the Bundesliga too. And last season, and I don't know, it's just there's something about it. It it really, really reminds me of the Premier League in, in lots of ways. Yeah. So it's a fun league. It's a really fun league to watch. Do you feel bad for Robert Lewandowski? No. Right now that he left, <laughs> he left Bayern Munich to go to Barcelona. And he's now playing in the Europa League for the first time in, in a long time in his career. And his former team is projected. A lot of people have them as favorites to freaking win the entire Champions League. I wonder when he... 
I had it in my notes a long time ago. He did play with them. Maybe it was when he was in Poland or maybe even a year with Dortmund. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because he did get a bit of a raw deal because Bayern Munich were trying (laughs) to get Erling Haaland and then the disrespect there and I get it. I don't know. Maybe I do feel a little bit bad for him because he's just in like a bad spot. I'm going to try and say this name. Ferenc Varas. I don't know. That was way worse and I shouldn't have even tried. Anyways, who's next? You pick. Okay, let's go to... Hmm. Let's do Salzburg or Rome. Okay. I'm going to tell you straight up, I didn't respect Salzburg. Even though right now they're not in the Champions League and they're in the Europa League, I didn't respect them enough in the group that they were in because they did find a way to tie both Chelsea and AC Milan and put and like compete within those games. Yep. I know that they didn't you know, have a stellar performance or top the group and they're out of the Champions League, but they're still a competitive team that took on... You want to talk about iconic clubs, a Chelsea oh, and an yeah. AC Milan, right? Yeah, they they had a really tough group, and I, they put on a good display. And, Agreed. Um, now, this is a team that doesn't have the Erling Haaland that they used to have. Yep. Oh, but, yeah, I remember when he played for that team. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of good guys. Like, Jesse Marsh was the manager for them, and now he's with Leeds. This is a, a, good, a good program that's able to develop players and move them on to the next level. Like you said, the Champions League group wasn't easy, and I think this is probably what their expectations were going into the tournament. And now they're here, and they've got Rome, who I think you're probably catching them at a pretty good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Noah Okafor is their kind of guy. I believe he's 22 years old. Ten goals this season in Damn. all competitions. He's probably the one to come through for them. Aduma is another one. Eight goals this season in all competitions. This is going to be an, a task for them, mostly because of Mourinho. I mean, oh, no. Okay, whatever. We'll get it back. Um, Rome, definitely underachieved. Definitely underachieved. They were one game away from not even making it to the to this round of knockout stages in um, in the Europa League. Real Batiste beat them. Luda Goretz beat them. They were actually losing to lose Luda Goretz again on the last game of the the group stage, which would have put them out of the competition and into the conference league, which I guess in a way might've been good for them because then they can Mm -hmm. try and uh, defend it. Tammy Abraham, got to be better. Yeah. That's a big reason why he's not in the England squad. He's not scoring goals this season. Last season, he had 27 in all competitions. This season, he has four. Oh, yikes. That's, it's not good enough. I know they've got uh, Dabala. I think he's injured now. Yeah, he is injured. He's only played seven games this season. Uh, Zaniola is another creative player for them. A Pellegrini, I believe his name is, is another one. A lot of talent on this team. Expectations, I think, were a lot higher after what they were able to achieve last season. Yeah, they won the co- they, yeah the they conference. Won it, league. and where, where they finished just the sixth in La Liga, currently sixth again. I would in Serie A. Uh, yeah, why, I keep saying I mean, La you Liga. love La Liga today. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, currently seventh, sorry, in in Serie A. Uh, just behind Juventus, who are actually yep. playing right now, so that's why it's changed. L O L. They should be higher up this league. I know they're only three, uh, one point behind Lazio, but it's a very talented team, and I think it's going to be tough to get European football this season with the way kind of things are playing out in Syria, and there's so many good teams and how tight it is. Like they got to be better. This is a good opportunity, I think, for both teams mm-hmm. to qualify for the next round. It's a uh, I think it's a lot tighter than people are probably giving credit for based off name value from one team and not the other. And this is exactly, this is a matchup where yesterday it was Inter and Porto for me in the Champions League where I'm like, it can go either way, right? Like I wouldn't be surprised if one team or the other one won. This is how I feel about Salzburg and Roma. The, what I will say, the slight edge for me is Jose Mourinho. Yeah. Um, This guy's a masterclass manager. And I just think that when, time comes to compete uh i know that he can't obviously get on the pitch and play himself he he's just a smart guy uh so i think that he'll have his team very well prepared i think that if he needs to make adjustments during the game he'll do it the right way and he's just a manager i i wouldn't necessarily doubt in this situation i think that he really wants to kind of add that europa league title trophy to his cabinet to his trophy case whatever you want to call it (sighs) That's giving me the edge on Salzburg. And I say that respectfully because I do think that Salzburg proved me wrong because I completely wrote them off in the Champions League and I shouldn't have. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Roma by a slight edge. Again, things can change a lot by February, 
but um, a game, a matchup for me that can go either way. I think when you just look at the squads, Rome has yeah. to they have, have to figure the, it have out. Have to have the edge, and they have to be better. I think I'm with you on the Mourinho thing. I think that he has high expectations for this team. I actually think this is one of the better jobs he's done as a manager to be able to take Rome to that next level. And uh, I feel like you, hold on. This is now. This now is kicked we're, now. Back. We're literally <laughs> kicking it back. This yeah. is nice. Yeah, no one can see this, but the laptops have gone from the table to our laps, and the legs have gone on the table now. Wow, so lots I going on here. I should have sat like this from the beginning, you yeah. guys. I would have probably taken a nap midway through our show. Okay, sorry, Liam. Continue. That's okay. I, you know, <laughs> I'll just go with. <laughs> I'll go with Rome too, but I, I think this will. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Salzburg came out on the other side of this. Okay, I'm so we we have the same picks really <laughs> in Champions League and Europa. Yeah, I feel like what we've done the last two shows is more of a a preview, I suppose, yeah. of what's to come. Because like it's, like I said, it's so hard to actually say who's gonna win and everything. But yeah, I we think, have the same gut feeling. Yeah, like you just kind of gotta look at the teams and be like, this is kind of the way it should probably go. Like it is a bit predictable, but. I think there's some ties in here that maybe won't be as predictable, too. Okay, who's next? Let's do Sevilla PSV. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, we talked about Van Nistelrooy. Throwback, one of my favorite players to watch for United, for the Dutch team back in the day. Now coaching yeah. PSV. Doing a great job. PSV beat Arsenal 2-0 in the Europa League. You mentioned it at the top of our show, one of the only teams to beat Arsenal this year. Arsenal still at the top of the Premier League table. Shout out Liam, who called that from the freaking yeah. episode of one on Kickback. <laughs> um, and Sevilla, a team, in my opinion, that's struggling. Very much so. They have had a lot of turnover in their squad. They just sacked the manager and probably fair. Um they were, what are they now, 17th in the Liga, right? They're really low down there. I had it in my notes. I forgot to type it out. Uh, they are currently 18th in La Liga because of a game that is going on right now with Celta Vigo. That is not good for a team that has literally won this competition like four times. I think they, they have the most Europa League wins combined with the UEFA Cup, I believe. Sevilla's got to be better, obviously. Like, that's pretty much an understatement <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right though they're not doing well at all and i understand there's been a lot of transfers in a lot of transfers out but also you're a good enough team that you should be able to attract good players still like there's a lot of guys on this squad that are still high quality and i don't know it just it's disappointing to see them here like i thought they could have they should have done wet, better in the champions league like some of the players, just to let you know, Isco, Thomas Delaney, who's a Danish international, will go to the World Cup. Um, Dahlberg is another guy who's going to go to the World Cup with Denmark. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on. Alex Tellers too played for United. Like, they got to be better. And PSV, on the other hand, is a team that's kind of growing back into the European picture. They were Champions yep. League qualified. They lost in the Champions League qualifying rounds to Rangers, funnily enough. So very curious how PSV would have done in the Champions League. But Cody Gakpo, he is probably the best player outside of the top five leagues right now. He has 12 goals and 15 assists in all competitions. Crazy. Unreal. The only issue PSV might have is when this tie comes around, he might be gone. Because they're probably going to sell him in January. I know Manchester United were in on him in September and August. Like, in that summer transfer window, so that'll be a big loss. Javi Simons is a guy they got from PSV. Nine goals, three assists, 19 years old. He is a special player. He's going to be really, really good. This is what I love about the European football picture right now. Like, you think about a team of PSV. If people don't watch the Dutch league. Yeah. They don't know. And that's okay. We don't have time to oh, watch yeah. every single team, every single league. If you're watch, if you're not watching football outside the European top five leagues, you don't know how dominant an Ajax or a PSV could be. But now we're going to be watching one of the best Europa leagues we've seen in a long time. Yep. And you hear a team like Sevilla who everyone, you know, knows in La Liga and you're going to think, oh, automatically, just because I know that team, just because I've heard of that team and I've heard about their previous success, that they're going to win. Yep. But PSV, in my opinion, 100% has built really good momentum on a really good team uh, and will, in my opinion, right now, if I'm putting a little bit of a prediction in, I do think that they'll beat them. I think so, too. They just beat Ajax. They just beat Ajax to go to the top of the Europa League. 
I actually think they're one of the teams that's probably like, man, I wish this World Cup wasn't happening. Because the momentum they could gain in the era of the Vizzy to kind of continue on. Well, they've got a few more. I have one more game still. Sorry. They oh, they're at the top of the era of the Yeah, they're first. That's uh, nuts. Yeah. So they're, I don't know. I think this is a good tie for PSV. Um, I, I have them winning most because Sevilla are terrible this season. <laughs> I mean, this is probably the easiest one out of all of them, to be honest, to really look and be like, yeah, this is a good one. I guess at this point, too, maybe the new manager's got some stuff in place for Sevilla, has the World Cup break to kind of get his image in place. But right now, it's hard to it's hard to stay off uh, Ruud van Nistelrooy and, and PSV. Like, that Arsenal game they played, Arsenal played a bit of a weaker team, but also they still beat them, you know? Yeah, yeah, you got to get credit where credit's due. I think that's major credits, major major props there. Yeah. All right, let's move on to their uh, to the team who's second in the air divisi, Ajax. Ajax versus Union Berlin. Maybe a bit of a hot take, and I said that Ajax is a team that could cont- contend in the Champions League. Uh, I didn't. I I know that they lost Ten Hag, but I'm like, and I know that they lost a lot of their players, but I'm like, it's still such a in my opinion, like this iconic club outside of Europe's top five leagues, yeah. a club that my dad always talked about, at least when I was growing up. Uh, I don't think that they're going to beat Union Berlin. I like what Union Berlin's doing this season. I, I said it on the show. I love the German fans. No one expected them to be the top of the Bundesliga, aside from just like literally a day ago. Yeah. <laughs> Bayern yeah. Munich now topping the group. Um, but it's just giving... This team gives me vibes for me personally of what Frankfurt was for me last season of this like incredible run and they beat Barcelona and their fans are hardcore and you, it's like almost this team you're really rooting for because it's a feel good story. That's how I feel about Union Berlin and I almost really want it for their fans more than anything because I can't imagine what it's like to be a supporter of a club like that and they're unexpectedly leading the Bundesliga for a while and you know they're potentially in the running to, to, to do a good job in the Europa League. Just a, for me, like a low-key, maybe like a low-key blockbuster matchup. It's something that when the game finishes, we're like, oh, did you see that moment? Yeah. That's how I feel about this game. I feel like there could be some good storylines. Me here, too. Definitely. Ajax lost a lot of players over yeah. the summer. I think they're in a bit of a retooling phase, which isn't something Ajax isn't familiar with. They've got a lot of good players. Mohamed Kudus is a good one. Kenneth Taylor, another Dutch guy. Uh, Brian Bromby, he's another good player. All these guys are under 22 years old. Crazy. This is kind of the next level. There's a bunch of other guys. I know they got some good defenders too, but there's a couple of guys on the list. Then you look at Union Berlin, fantastic season. I know. They've only been in the Bundesliga like two or three years or something like that. Like, I remember watching them qualify for it. It was kind of kind of nuts. The Bayer Leverkusen loss, uncharacteristic, I think is a good way to put it. I think this World Cup break is coming at a fantastic time for them because I think they their squad depth isn't great, mostly because they're just they're not a big team. Like they're very they're punching above their weight, and I think that's very respectable to say. And it's why I love them. Yeah, and I think you even you look at some of the interviews they have, like the, it gives me very much Leicester City vibes, where they're like, "Are oh, we just trying to not get relegated?" Yeah, it's like you're first in the Bundesliga. What do you mean? But January window is going to be big for them. I think they need to really add more squad depth and perhaps that would help them regain some more momentum in the Bundesliga. They probably should have won their group, but they did beat out Braga, who were having a good season. Only conceded two goals. Crazy. But only scored four. Damn. Yeah. So I'm going with Ajax. Okay. We're on the opposite one on this one. It's good. It's good. We need to have some. Yeah, we need some content. We need some content. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I just... Um, I, I feel it. I, I understand. I understand. Sometimes it's nice rooting for the underdog. Yep. Um, and to me, like, okay, for example, Union Berlin last season finished in fifth place. And I don't think anyone was like they're going to... Oh, yeah. Definitely. I completely agree. You know? So, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going with it. Let me double we'll check here. I think that was their first year in Bundesliga. I'm sure it was only... Let me check. So, 2021... They sorry, this is now their third year in Bundesliga. Nuts. I don't it know. is crazy. Nuts. It's just a just come a long way. It's come a long way and it's good to see. Okay, I'm gonna mispronounce this. Nantes, Juve and I, think, I believe it's Nantes. Nantes. I don't know. It could it could be wrong. These French names are hard. Nantes. Just wait till we have to say this one. 
Scott Durant ran I'm leaving those last two for you, hey? I know. Honestly, I, I they're actually, at the bottom of my list. I got this one. Okay. Mitchyland. Oh, well, that's good. I've seen Mitchyland. We can, do you want to do that one or that one since I said the name and we don't have to say it again? Go ahead. Okay. We'll go right <laughs> off that. We'll just yeah. say what I just said. Okay. <laughs> You go ahead. You go ahead. I don't have many notes on this. I'm be very, very honest. I don't know much. Oh, I, sporting, of course. But this Michelin, I don't know much about them. Okay, so they're a Danish team for people who don't know home. Typically um, qualify for Champions League and then get knocked out into the Europa League. They have been in the Champions League before, though. Their group, nuts. Yeah? Absolutely insane how it finished. Let me pull it up here so I don't get this wrong. Feyenoord, eight points. Damn. Two draws, two wins, two losses. Michiland, eight points. Two wins, two draws, two losses. Lazio, eight points. Two wins, two draws, two losses. Sturm Graz, want to take a guess? Eight (laughs) points. (laughs) Yeah. Two (laughs) wins, two draws. Their group was based off goal difference. Holy. And they got through... With a plus four over Lazio. Unreal by them to get through over Lazio. I'm sure everyone was looking at thinking like, oh, that wasn't that group. Like Feyenoord, a really good team too. But man, just unreal how that kind of played out in uh, Michiland. I hear that. Okay, I hear that because now that I know that, and thanks because that's actually unreal stats, I'd pick them over sporting. I think Sporting yeah. should have, and respectfully, because I they, Group D in the Champions League, Frankfurt is the team that I said, you know, yep. star. Tottenham, you can say what you want about them. Marseille finished last. I still think Sporting should have done better in that group. If Michelin has success like they've been having and then been able to pull this stuff out, maybe they do beat Sporting. Yeah, so the guy to look out for in Michelin is Evander. Five assists, which was the most in the Europa League so far this Crazy. season. Crazy. Actually has zero in the domestic league, which is quite funny. But 24-year-old Brazilian, they scored 12 goals in six games, which was the fifth most in the Europa League. In the group we just said, you could probably argue that's the toughest group in this competition. To be honest, and with the fact that they had Lazio, who were doing fantastic in Serie A this year, third. And Feyenoord, who went to the Europa Conference League final last season... You look through these other groups, and yes, there's a lot of other good ones too. But I don't know. The fact that they finished second, I think, is quite a credit to them. And then you look at Sporting, like you said, like they underachieved, I think, in Mm -hmm. the Champions League. I think they should have made it through, especially after they beat Tottenham. They lost to Frankfurt, to Marseille twice. Then they drew against Tottenham in London, but that was the game where the goal was disallowed. So they probably should, they basically would have lost their last four games in the Champions League. Don't even get me started on that goal. We've talked about it yeah. on the show. They got very lucky, in my opinion. I agree. And just, um, I expected more from them, especially since, like, you know, their cousins, uh, Porto and Benfica, are killing it. Sporting not doing too bad in the Portuguese League. I think that they're mid or fifth. Fifth, but also, fifth. they should be higher. I, 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 that's why I'm saying, I'm like, that was a team maybe that I felt like. With one of the like with Juventus when we were doing our pregame show with the Champions League, we put a lot of like onus on the Italian teams, and we said that Juve would do well, and they they under like heavily yeah. underperformed. Massively, kind of how I feel about Sporting too. Now knowing all of these good tidbits, yeah, about like, Michelin, maybe Sporting gets you know a nice exit out of European football. I think this is going to be a tie. Well, Michelin should probably be doing better in the uh, the Danish league. They're currently in eighth, but only saying that they're only three points behind uh, FC Copenhagen in third, who, you know, we're a Champions League team too. I think eventually by the time we get to this point, Mitchell will be in much better state in the Danish league. So I'm going to go with Mitchell okay, just because I think momentum could get on their side. One of these teams has got to get through. That's unexpected. Hashtag eight points. Hashtag eight point group. <laughs> I'm going to go with them and goodbye. Sport in Lisbon. Smell you later. Yeah, that's how I feel. They shouldn't even be here. Uh, that's how Marseille. I feel. This should be Marseille. Yeah. Because that point, let me double check. But that point basically gave them the 
cha- the Europa League spot in that group. Yeah, it did, right? Because that was the crazy group where every yeah. So if they had lost that game, they would have had six points and had a minus two goal differential. Marseille would have had six points with a goal differential of zero mm-hmm. and the head to head over Sporting. Yeah, yeah, no. So we're the same on that. Smell you later. Yeah, smell you later. <laughs> Um, okay, Juve and Nantes. Thanks for letting me know how to pronounce that. I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I've not watched one game from Nantes in my life. I actually watched one this season. Not one in my life. They are 16th place in Ligue 1, but they won the French Cup last season. Yeah, the Coupe de France. Yes, they did. Um, here's my take. Uh, Juve are terrible this season. Juve have a problem with Allegri and their management and they are failing to even address a single thing like i've said on a previous show everything is on fire in the background and they're just saying it's fine it's fine and yes maybe allegri needs time but i don't buy that narrative uh i think that they are a little bit in trouble especially with some of the injuries they've had maybe i mean makaibi haifa beat juve maybe yeah. someone like Nance does the same thing i don't know I, I, all I'm saying is I wouldn't ever right now be like, it's a lock for Juventus. Here's my thing on Juve. I think they're going to get a lot of players back. Pogba's going to come back. Chiesa, Chiesa on it. Chase. Oh, man. No name team over here. I can't do it. Whatever but like, his name is. Back from injury or back from the World Cup with Di Maria, how quick do they have to adjust to all that? Yeah, I think with Pogba, uh, he's, just, he's such a good player. He should be able to fit in. Uh, Chiesa is now back a little bit too. He just came back in that Champions League game. Whoever they played in the last game, was it PSV they played or Benfica? It was PSV. Uh, yeah. In the ben, Champions League? Yeah, Juve? Ben- Benfica beat Maccabi High for like 6-1, right? So yeah, yeah. it was. So yeah, he yeah, came yeah. back in that game. But I, they did get bullied by Benfica. They did. Yeah. They did. Um, Nantes, minus five goal differential in this competition too. Pretty tough group, actually. Olympiacos was in that group, not a bad yeah, team. Yeah, not a bad... They, I checked their group. It wasn't bad. No, it's not bad at all. Only two games, one in league on this season. They're definitely underachieving. They're kind of... In a similar way, they're kind of like Uni and Berlin, where their squad isn't good enough to compete in this competition and compete in league on. The only difference is Uni and Berlin's obviously managed to be able to have some success yeah. in Bundesliga, where Nantes haven't been able to do it in league on. I think Juventus, I'll, I'll take this one mostly just because the strength of the squad eventually should take it over. I know they lost to Maccabi Haifa, but I don't know. I just, I, I feel like you can't, I can't write them off in this one. Blas is the one guy on Nantes to look out for. 24-year-old, having a decent season, was good last season. I know he was linked to like West Ham and like a couple of those other like mid-table right. Europa Conference League teams in the Premier League. So he's a good one. But I just think Juventus should have. Yeah, I can't have much of a solid opinion. Because like I said, I've never once in my life seen Nantes play. So it's not like yeah. I can even have any kind of idea. And this is the beauty of the Europa League now is that people who watch Juventus, like myself, are going to have an opportunity to watch a team who's in 16th place in Ligue 1 and have an idea of what they're about, how they play, who their players are, what their philosophy is. And I think this is what's very cool about this Europa League picture. Mm -hmm. Because if Nantes was taking on a team like, let's be honest, I'm going to be completely honest, Salzburg, I probably wouldn't take three hours out of my day to watch that match when we have a million other games going on. So now Juventus, again, we've been talking about this theme of iconic clubs, an iconic Italian team has taken on a nonce and I'm going to watch and I'm going to want to know everything about this French team. However, no one in their minds had Maccabi Haifa beating Juve. Juve gave them their first Champions League win in over 20 years. Mm-hmm. And um, things can happen, especially with this Juve team. I think that there's a lot going on in these in these big clubs like we spoke to earlier, United, Barcelona, Juve. Just a lot of mess in the background, a lot of drama around their team. And I do think that weighs on a club, and I do think that that weighs on the players. Yep. So we'll see. I'll have more of an opinion when I see <laughs> – <laughs> the first game, obviously, and, and see what Nantes brings. But 16th place in Ligue 1. I mean, not the the biggest contender for it, Juventus. Looking at these teams, I, I would th- I think they probably are the weakest team left. That's what I read. They, yeah. they said that they're like the small, like they're the minnows. They, they're they're in, here in because Europa. they won the cup, yeah. right? So I think they even, I don't, let me double check. They might have finished like eighth in Ligue 1 last season. Let me check it. Ninth 
last season in league, and they were eleven points off Europe, their European spot. I don't know. I think Nantes is they're they're a good story. They've done really well. They're not typically one of those teams like climbs a ladder in league and they're just one of those mid table teams. I would not be surprised if they worry more about not getting relegated this season and trying to advance in the Europa League. Yeah, it makes sense. Bolton were in a very similar spot one year when they were in the UEFA <laughs> Cup. And I remember we he was very disappointed as a fan because it was the same year we did really well against... He was having Marseille Atletico Madrid. I can't exactly remember. And we played Sporting, actually, in one of the knockout games. And the team we played, we played like... So many reserve players, and it was just like, oh, man, like, I wish we were kind of just going for it, but also you understand it as a fan being like, I don't want to see us in, get relegated. Then we, I think we ended up getting relegated anyway, yeah. so it didn't even matter. But, yeah, I think they've, they're have they enjoying what they've been able to do so far in these competitions. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised just to see them focus on Premier uh, no, League and more. All right, last game. Shakhtar, our Ukrainian friends i'm trying to didn't they have a game where they upset someone or they had this crazy win they beat leipzig they beat was that the was that the game where wasn't it a big score or am i making stuff yeah, four won, not oh won, no four one they won four one yeah that had to see guys my memory sucks i don't remember crazy. like scores and all that stuff but i do remember shaktar i'm me being happy for them because yeah well they beat they beat leipzig four one on the okay. first game and then they lost four nothing and then, yeah, in the last <laughs> game, which were essentially knocked them out. Uh, they drew against Celtic, and they drew against Real Madrid as well. Which is an impressive... They're a good team. And they're one of these teams that probably looked to the group and was like, okay, we can challenge for second, but we have to get third. So we can at least go into this competition. Uh, they've done really well in the Ukrainian Premier League with everything that's been going on there. And yeah, currently tough. second in that league behind uh, Dnipro, who... Are in the, also in this competition too, and they haven't lost a game yet. They're a good team. Then you get Rounds, who second qualified second behind Fenerbahce in Group B, having a really good season they in the are. league. Earned third. They haven't really been that high. It's only been a couple of years, I suppose. But Camavinga was a big D. That's where he came from. Uh, Martin Terrier is a man to watch. Three goals in the Europa League this season. Damn. Yeah, I don't know. I think this is this is one, you know. You look at all these and you're like, yeah, we got the Barcelona Real Madrid, uh, Barcelona United, Bayern Munich, uh, Bayer Leverkusen, Monaco, like all these ones. But I really like this one. I really like just the evenness in the competition, what it could really bring. And I think these are two teams that are really going to gun to try and advance in this competition. I think that, like we said about one of the other matchups, that this could be one with a storyline. I think that's what we said about Ajax and Union. Um, I think this is another one. And Shakhtar surprised me in that first game where they beat Leipzig 4-1. I was so happy for them. Yeah, me too. Uh, it was a feel-good story for obvious reasons with the climate of the world. And um, just, again, a team that I will root for, a team that I haven't watched, you know, day in and day out. <laughs> did we do that at the same time? Yeah, we did. We were in sync. We did not mean to do that. Um, but, you know, just, again, these, these two teams – Yep. Um, and I love that because it shows you the growth. It shows you um, the competition in Europe. It's good. It's changing, right? So I don't really have an opinion with this one. I don't uh, – maybe I'll say because my heart likes Shakhtar, I'll say Shakhtar. But, I mean, Rens is third in, in league earned, so. I, I'm on the Shakhtar train. I like, I like the story. I'm really. I think a lot of people are obviously rooting them for obvious reasons. They're currently in Poland playing still, I believe, um, which is just a nuts thing it's to have so to sad. do. It's so sad. And yeah, I'm hoping they do well. Looking at these groups, just these ones here. I know there's obviously more teams. I think they're probably one of. The, they've got to be one of the stronger ones. Just, I would not be surprised to see Shakhtar kind of go on a bit of a run here. Like one of these two teams, even one of these teams in this. This matchup, I think, could really advance well in this competition. I can't wait, guys. For the first time in a long time, I, you know, obviously the Europa League is something that's always available to us as football fans and something we love tuning into. But for the first time in a long time, if not ever in my life, I'm like, this is on part in my schedule with the Champions League. Yeah, 
yeah, there's a lot going on. And you, it's funny because I, I was thinking the same. And then you look at some of the teams that aren't in it yet because they advanced and it's just going to get better. Like, let me read off a few here. Arsenal, Fenerbahce, Real Batis, uh, Real Sociedad, United, Feyenoord, Freiburg. Like, there's still so many good teams left in this competition. And you think this is good? Just wait till the next round when all these good teams now place the first place teams. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Yeah, and uh, do you know what? I think after the World Cup too, it's gonna. Well, first of all, football's gonna be dialed down a lot. Like when they, uh, if when they did the Champions League draw, it was uh, very early in the morning for us. But I re I rewatched it, and the I can't remember who it was. Whoever the guy was, he was like, "Yeah, we've had a historic Champions League season this year. We played all six games in nine weeks. It's like that is insane. Like usually they spread this out like." For like months, it's not, uh, it's not healthy it's to be not, honest. It's not healthy for the footballers. Um, think about how much football we've been consuming. Yeah. Every day I go home, I'm like, there's four games to watch at the same time, essentially, which is, uh, of course, the best job ever. But it's just so hard to know every single thing about every team and every player. But I do think you're right. After the World Cup, it's going to kind of be a little bit more muted. Yeah, and maybe on Tuesday we can talk about some of the squads that were announced, like. The USA announced their squad, a bit of controversy in the goaltending department there. Like we mentioned, kind of off the top, England squad was announced. Germany announced theirs when we walked in here. Was said, his was, uh, was said, his was. And Portugal was announced. Uh, yeah, who did was say? Canada's squad should be pretty close. Uh, it is Sunday. Okay, so we'll definitely talk about that because they play tomorrow. And it's, yeah, so I think that's, could you imagine if they named the squad before the game? And it's like, oh, there you go. What day is it tomorrow, Friday? Tomorrow is Friday, so wow, yes. Wow, guys. Well, happy Football Fridays to you, Ian. Yes. Uh, we've got a lot going on, but we're happy to cover everything. You guys let us know what you think, especially if you're a big fan of one of these smaller clubs. I say that respectfully. If you're one of, uh, a fan of these, big, uh, these smaller clubs, let us know what you think and your opinion and why they're special, why they might go through. Let us know what, you know, your opinion is in the conversation. Yeah. Let us know if you think we're crazy. And also, if you ever wait for me to learn how to pronounce names, feel free to let me know so I can figure that out on the shows. Thank you. Same. I <laughs>